So hi everyone who's logging on. I'm Molly Foster, Curatorial Assistant for Arcadia Exhibitions. I'm just gonna give everybody a couple more minutes before we begin. It's just gonna give a everyone a few more minutes to log on. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Molly Foster, Curatorial for, Assistant for Arcadia Exhibitions, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this virtual studio visit with Polly Apfelbaum. Before we begin, I would like to recognize the Lenny Lenape peoples, past, present, and future, on whose stolen ancestral land Arcadia University sits. I would like to thank Matt Pellegrini, Shanae Brown, Elizabeth Farrell, Matt Borgen, and Jamar Nicholas for their support in organizing this webinar. Thank you also to Polly Apfelbaum, Curator and Director of Arcadia Exhibitions Richard Torchia, Professor Greg Moore, and Production Assistant Rachel Geisinger for sharing your time with us today. It's an honor to introduce our artist in residence, Polly Apfelbaum, who has cultivated a practice that fuses traditions of painting, craft, and installation. A graduate of Tyler School of Art in Elkins, Elkins Park, Polly Applebaum has exhibited consistently since the mid 1980s. She has been a recipient of the Rome Prize, a Guggenheim Fellowship, an Academy Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, a Richard Diebenkorn Fellowship, a Joan Mitchell Fellowship, an Artists Fellowship from the New York Foundation for the Arts, a Creative Capital Award, an Anonymous Was a Woman Grant, and a Pollock Krasner Foundation grant. Applebaum's work is included in the collections of the Museum of Modern Art New York, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Brooklyn Museum of Art, the Carnegie Museum of Art, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, among others. During a residency in Arcadia's ceramic studio, Applebaum has been creating new works with the assistance of Professor Greg Moore and Rachel Geisinger. The residency will culminate in exhibitions, public programs, and a publication in spring of 2022 that explores identity and the influence of Pennsylvania German craft and culture on Applebaum's cross-disciplinary practice. This project is supported by the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage. For project updates, visit our website at gallery.arcadia.edu and follow us on social media at Arcadia Exhibitions. Over the next hour, we'll keep Polly company virtually as she works in Arcadia University's Murphy Hall. We invite attendees to ask Polly questions using the Zoom chat feature, which then I'll read out loud to Polly and Greg as they're in the studio. If at any point you have trouble hearing during this meeting, we ask you to please turn up your sound or use a pair of headphones. As a way of starting things off, Polly, you started working in ceramics around 2010 after taking a course at the Greenwich House Pottery in New York City. I'm wondering if you could say something about how the work you're making in this residency so far differs from your previous work in clay. Well, it differs a lot because um, I'm working one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two with Greg Moore. And so thinking about um, all of his knowledge has been really helpful. We're also doing something that I would never do on my own is we're making clay and we're making the glazes. And as you can see, I'm glazing today and that's one of my most favorite things. And color has so much is so important in the work. So we've spent a lot of time experimenting with color and glazes. So all of these things um, I'm learning a lot and I couldn't do on my own. So it's, an, it's been an incredible experience to kind of figure out a residency and also what the sh a show is going to be. So that's very different. I'm wondering too if you could um, speak a little bit more about your previous work in ceramics. Well, it was very um, 
like all my work, very intuitive. And I have to say, because we're in Pennsylvania, um, I, I grew up here and 10 minutes from here, and I went to a school, Nikon, a first school, where I did ceramics. So um, coming back to ceramics 30 something years later was really nice. And it's been very different when you had a gap of time. But um, being able to tap into a history, too, we looked into Pennsylvania German um, ceramics and worked with terracotta on course. So you'll see in the room um, right now I'm glazing terracotta. And but there's also we've worked a lot with you know um, slip wool, and there's a tradition in Pennsylvania culture. You know, hold this up. The, <laughs> um, maybe um, you can see. And we work with molds too. So I never worked with porcelain this way. So we're using porcelain as a material. Porcelain as clay. So slip is, is clay. And so we're also working with molds. I've never worked with molds. So we really um, keep upping the ante. So we started with an image of a face kind of based on a Pennsylvania German textile, but also pulling from older work, the show that I did called The Potential of Women. Now, also, I've worked with flowers. Um, I've never made ceramic flowers. And so, what's interesting is there's so many different influences and so many different ways of working. And we're really trying to tap into um, a lot of different things right now. So, that's um, where we are. And maybe uh, Greg, Professor Greg Moore, um, you want to introduce maybe what you're working on in the back there? Sure. Um, just I want to add to what Polly just said about the porcelain and its relationship to color. I think um, you know this has been uh, kind of an explosive experiment of trying to get more and more color into the work. Um, through glaze, as you see Polly applying glaze to the, the earthenware objects, um, but also through porcelain as material. That, that flower that Rachel was holding up isn't actually glazed with color. The color is in the material itself, and then there's a clear glaze applied over top. So, um, so there's color on the surface, there's color in the material, there's color everywhere, which seems appropriate <laughs> to me. <laughs> um, what I'm working on here is the step before um, Polly gets uh, to glazing. And, and these are wet earthenware slabs of clay with drawings that have, uh, that have been done by, um, by Polly. In this case, it's a drawing of a, a barn, Pennsylvania German barn. This is an Ellinger painting, right? Yes, based on a, uh, David Ellinger is this whole project um, kind of goes back to a painter who um, painted, was influenced by the Pennsylvania German also, and he was sort of an appropriator of Pennsylvania Dutch German culture. So I grew up in my house, there were four of David's paintings. So this has been an adventure, sort of in, um, looking at David's work and sort of the influence of his work besides Pennsylvania German. So it goes through a couple um, steps of appropriation. So I feel like it's almost a two-person show um, with David, the spirit of David in this work, and also my me. So um, the face could be, David had a mustache, so you can see the face. One side could be David, and one half could be me, but it's also the gender, a male, female, and also a heart. So a lot of the iconography, flowers, hearts, um, are in the um, Pennsylvania German fractures, the drawings. 
also a lot of the architecture that was drawn in Shaker culture, also in uh, Pennsylvania Germany. So um, that's what we're, we're slowly, the, the barns are new, and we just started drawing the barn. And you can see a kind of sketch that I made from the, the David, um, the David Ellinger uh, painting. It's of a tobacco barn. And I really love that the color almost were like these, um, the, the head feels like a puzzle piece to me. The flowers too. The flowers are stenciled. Um, a lot of David's work, and there's a, a technique called thurums, which are thurums are stenciled on velvet. So when I the flowers that I've done over the years, most of them are hand drawn doodle flowers. But these I wanted to kind of reference David Ellinger's way of working. So I found a stencil at Michael's, and I also think it's almost like a corsage. And we've made it the flowers in, um, you can see, one glazed um, flower. I'll hand it to you. And we're um, trying now, like um, cutting out the circle. So now I think the flower has more of a shape to it. So um, this is this table is all um, test flowers. And then what's going to happen is, and I'm really happy about this, is the students are going to help me, and we're going to make the make the flowers. So being in a um, a school environment, a college is really nice and and so because of covid we started last um august and it was just the three of us in the studio and now slowly the students are able but just a few at a time so we wanted i thought it'd be a wonderful opportunity to engage the students if they wanted to i know that they probably want to do their own work too but I thought it'd be a really nice to kind of collaborative. You asked what's the difference? You know, artists, we, I have my own kiln. I, I work by myself, but this is very, very different. And this is such a, a I'm so lucky to work with Greg and Richard right now. It's just, and I never could have made what we're doing um, on my own. Yeah, the students are, um, really engaged in the flower production. That started up just a few weeks ago, really, when we got back on campus, and and um, it's been a great experience for them to get to know Polly, to be a part of the process and the work, um, and I, it's like a win-win. And so we're working on we're working on them. Um, I'm going to make a flower oh, great. now, so that you uh, you could see from start to almost finished to the one that was held up to finish. Oh, great. See all the now here, I'm going to show you, should we show you one that has been um, so This flower is, um, this is without this. <laughs> and so the process for people who don't know about ceramics, that then has to dry. The wet clay has to dry, then it's called green wax. It goes in the bisque. And then what happens? I glaze it, and then it goes back in the pan. So we have um, one question from uh, Patch, who is the graphic design professor at Arcadia. Um, and he asked, you've both mentioned the changes in the work and the spirit of the work. Has it been working in it, or how has it been working in a new or different studio? What are the pros and cons of leaving your personal space to work at Arcadia? Oh, interesting. Um, you know, I always love having a new empty space to fill up. It's always for some reason on residencies. Um, over the years, I've been to Yaddo and to McDowell Colony and besides the Academy in Rome. So um, 
for me, it's, it's wonderful, leaving everything behind. I think that's a really good thing. You know, I started um, COVID by myself in the barn, made a lot of work. And it was really nice thinking, you know, when I got here, kind of like always having a fresh start. So it's been really helpful for me to have a kind of fresh start. Thanks. <laughs> I mean, like the energy in the studio when Polly walks through the door is just the best. <laughs> but you know, I think that Greg said, I also met Trace, and that, you know, I think for some artists, if I didn't do that, and that I've been doing for 20 years working with this with one person. So yes. I said, you know, it's, it's really, you have to, you know, learn and, and kind of, it takes time, but, you know, I'm so ready. We've all been by ourselves so much. And, you know, I, driving over here today, I said, you know, this is really keeping me grounded and sane. And, and the fact that, because um, it's really hard you know, yes, as an artist, you work a lot by yourself, and I love that. But, you know, you put the work out, and you, you do have a community, and you do, you know, there is things that, you know, I was really, um, I have to say, I was showing a lot, and, and then, boom, you're, you know, all that stuff, everything's postponed. So, having a, a connection here and having you know working in this space that every time you come to this space you're very serious and that's what the printmaking too it's one of the hardest things i do because you do have people there but um i think that having the the um, printmaking experience of that collaborative has helped me and they're oh, everybody's very nice here. <laughs> you know, in a way, I'm sure there's another question, but in, in a way, we've been talking a lot about how this work in ceramics connects to Polly's printmaking practice. Um, maybe as much, sometimes even more than her previous practice in ceramics. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you could see that evidence uh, in a lot of what we're working on today. And in, partic in particular, well, I guess everything we're working on today. Um, but I think that relationship between surface and material, um, those, those lines between those two, um, we're trying to blur as much as possible. So it's, you know, it feels like it's based on um, a lot of your previous printmaking yeah, work and, and the experimentation in the ceramics. Yeah. Well. yeah. When you know, I think that sometimes when you, you know, take on something as if it's new again, you're, you're very open, you know, and then I was, the great thing of having Greg's knowledge, and um, we do very different things, but, you know, finding the overlap, and I think, you know, right now, too, we're also working on something that comes out of a previous show that was at Icon in Birmingham and at the Kessler, waiting for the UFOs, and that's the target. And we're making target bowls. And somehow we just, Greg makes, a, works with a Blue Hill barn and makes a lot of um, ceramics that is utilitarian. And I've never done anything utilitarian in my life. So that's been really nice. So somehow you can see over here, I don't know if it's on, on the radar, yes. So, you know, we made this first, we made this bowl. And I love it. <laughs> so it's just, and it came out more. And as you can see, too, I'm the messiest glazer in the world. You wouldn't want me to paint your house. You know, and, and so, you know, and just, I just, it's really, you know, so I've been trying when I came here. You know, first was not think about the show, but of course I'm thinking about the show. But also, you know, see what we can do, you know, new, 
with kind of my history and ceramics. Then, you know, we just, so each week it's like, oh, what if we, I can't, but I want to do a ball. You know, and then we sort of like, like let's do some um, bowls. And so, you know, that's been what's so nice. And, and it's kind of, um, that is with pivot. I come, usually I come, I've been drawing in the studio, and I'm like, what if we make it clay? So I'm thinking of clay as I think of everything else. Now, installation, painting, all of these things. And when I first started back with ceramics, like a child, you know, it's just, you know, a nice thing to do with my friends every Friday. And then slowly it became something else. And but I like that, um, you know, my conversation recently that I had with David Pegel, and he said, there's something about the amateur. And the amateur is rooted in love. And also um, a kind of bringing a kind of freshness to looking at work that's not what you usually do. And I think it's, for me, this way of, um, material you know just this in um looking at different materials and how can i bring them into my world and what does it mean and kind of analyzing them but so now we're thinking of clay as painting and that's kind of what i think of as everything the world is painting so it's, it's kind of that's what's going on right now <laughs> and you could tell with like the glaze on that one uh, flower there that's pretty well focused in on the other other screen. It's like clay becomes painting, but painting becomes clay as well. Yeah. And, and the way that the materials apply is, is unique. Well, also this um, glaze is really lovely and difficult to work with. <laughs> and, you know, this makes me crazy that you're seeing this. It will be very beautiful. <laughs> it looks very messy. I mean, it's sort of messy. I like jerks and things like that, but it does become, you know, the magic of fire. You know, the magic of putting things in the in the in the kiln. So, you know, that's a difference too. When I work with when I'm making, you know, the gouache drawing, I have say a lot of color, but it's straight out of the tube. In printmaking, you have to make all the color. Here we made color. We have um, over here, and this is kind of what I um, rely on is, is um, Rachel has done color text. And the colors are based on the wash colors. And um, what we've done is, you know, um, here. And also, here's the um, Mm -hmm. this, and, this, and this is the porcelain test. So, um, so before you do anything, you make color tests, and you make. Um, they're also now going back and working with um, trying to get the right clay. And we can maybe talk about that. Yeah. Um... Let me ask a few questions and then I'll I'll let you get into that. <laughs> but we, we have a few, two more that have come in since um, the last one. Uh, David Gwynn, another professor at Arcadia and a mural artist, um, asks, did working on the mural with Jefferson Health open up any ideas or inform the work that you're currently doing at Arcadia? So the thing is, that is... Um, a mural that I did with a, one of my oldest friends who went to Tyler with me. And long story short, she was in the oncology, um, she had leukemia, it's in remission now, but we worked together on the mural three years. It's a collaboration, um, you know, that comes more out of my, um, I've worked with wallpaper, I'm going to have wallpaper in the Arcadia show. Um, that's a separate collaboration, and did I learn something? Um, 
you know, I was really lucky because, you know, working with my friend was, it was a pure joy. And, and her generosity of wanting to have something for the patients in the oncology department to look at. So it was, I'd say it's half and half, but you know, really for me, I was thinking more about her than I was thinking about me. So, um, and that's a good exercise. <laughs> so, um, and I hope people will go see it. It's at um, 11th, 11th and Chestnut, um, and you have to look up. So it was done for the, um, the residents, the patients in the hospital. And then Tessa asks, I'm wondering if and how COVID and an increased time at home within domestic spaces has affected the kind of work being made. Uh, she also says that the house iconography is particularly striking to her in this context. Oh, thank you. Well, yes, the other thing that's gone on, um, I had three months by myself um, and my husband upstate. But as soon as I could, I have a 94-year-old mother who lives 10 minutes from here. And being in the house that I grew up in was the start of this whole project. But every day um, that I'm there is a reminder of, you know, looking at what really um, influenced my work and also it has enabled me, COVID has enabled me to look at maybe the more personal. So it's been a very meaningful time. It's a very hard time um, with, with so much death and um, the politics too, where it was, I think that none, none of us have ever really experienced um, what's been going on. So you cannot be, and you know, the faces, we'll come back to the faces. I was looking at a painting of David Ellinger's without a face, and that sort of started the whole thing. And what I wanted to do is bring a face, and we said an icon or kind of a keystone. And so I think the faces started really out of, out of COVID. Um, a kind of a presence of people. Uh, one thing to, to note or remember or just to note is that this process started um, in the fall of 2017 when we mm -hmm. met Holly in New York at a show. And so Richard and Holly and I have been conceiving of this for this is going on oh. four years now. Whoa, so, hard to believe. Yeah. So it's crazy. Yeah. The last year has been done during COVID, but there were Three productive years before that, I mean, and hopefully we will culminate in an exhibition post COVID. Also, you know, um, the what's interesting for me is how influences come and how you know I'm not I've been an artist for a long time and the what we're doing now, you know, we, I've had 7,000, I'm sure Richard has gone crazy, I've had 7,000 ideas of what this show was going to be. And I think until we started the residency, and I also have, you know, none of us, this is the first time Arcadians had this kind of residency. So I, I have been very conscious of wanting it not to end in the sense. And, and because before it started, I was like, oh, this is what this show is. Or this is, you know, and then we moved the show. So we gained a whole other year. So I was like, okay, I don't want to say think about the end result. I want to keep making things. So I had about a month ago, we thought, okay, Let's get, the, what is the show? You know, we're doing this, we're doing that. And I have a wonderful assistant named Dan Cole. Hello, Dan, I don't know if you're watching. But Dan, you know, has, he's my uh, 
right there. Oh, I'm left handed. So he's been great. And we had an idea and we drew it up. And then it was almost, I said to uh, Richard, it was very baroque. It was very full. And then I was like, okay, scratch that. <laughs> and then so now, trying to see what we've done, how it could be used, and then I decided I wanted the ball. So I'm very excited that I'm just trying to say with my thinking, it's been complicated because of this idea of a residency, what is that, and take full advantage of that, and the idea of a show, and throw David Ellinger into that. <laughs> so, so trying to you know negotiate, navigate, and also it is this whole idea of coming home. You know, for me, it's loaded. You know, I think that um, I have this love, and it, and it, I think it goes back to Pennsylvania German of abstraction, thinking about the Amish quilts. These are things that I grew up with, and they're very, a lot of the things are abstract. And here I am kind of pulling a narrative in. So that's something that's very complicated. I think it's very loaded for me. And um, so that's, <laughs> I'll leave it at that right now. So uh, Karen David wrote, thinking about the word amateur that was mentioned earlier, if you glazed on greenware so that there is only one firing, would this create welcome mistakes or not work at all? There is a wonderful freedom to discovering a new material and finding accidents that work in some way. Is this something you've encountered? P.S. What a treat to hear you discuss your work. Oh, so nice. I'll give you that one. Um, I, the question is, would there, would there be anything gained by not this? So if, if you glazed on greenware, so there's only one firing, would this create welcome mistakes or would that not work? It would work. Um, I don't think there would be a significant change in the outcome. I think the, the broader question is about um, opening up to um, I don't know if they're mistakes, but to allow the process to inform the outcome through doing. And uh, at every step along the way, we're trying to do that. So um, there's a lot of handwork uh, on, on my end of things. There's a, a tremendous amount of handwork on Holly's end of things. And the more that the objects go back and forth, um, and, and in fact, in incorporating students into the flower making, the more hands involved, I think that might be the answer to the question more than single firing, is that there are more people engaged in the process yeah. of opening up to that sort of, um, what's a better word than mistake? Um, so the interesting thing about opening it up to, to the students is that I have certain rules and um you know they're arbitrary rules and i think every every artist does so i'll say but i'm really interested to see within those parameters what their hand looks like so it looks like um like in there's something like 17 petals or 21 petals i don't know so that enables me to use 21 colors so i'll say to the artist the students you have to use every color um, in those different, you know, and also try and stay within the lines. Well, look at me, I'm out of the line. So, you know, I think it's, uh, I love that, you know, chance just happens, you know, a spill, a this. The thing that we've noticed with the kind of way of working, which doesn't work, like we have a lot of broken things. <laughs> And so, you know, now we're trying to figure out, well, that's something we don't want. So within our parameters, and then also by using different clays and figuring out, that's been really fascinating, like the split layer, 
than the terracotta. Probably the porcelain is more gray sensibility, and the terracotta in kind of the hand mess, you know, the way I work, like if you look at the drawings too, you know, like the relationship of this wash to this. So I'm really interested in that. So I haven't ruled that out. And I think, do we have a mold? Maybe we can see the uh, one of the, you know. Uh, so Oh, I also want you to see to the back. So, oh, there's the camera. <laughs> there's the back. And then here you can see the front. So you can see, like, if I held up, this is a fail case. And this is when we were first started um, blazing. And those, these are both test pieces. So here you can see the difference between how refined the porcelain is, and I love that. And then we did the marbleized on the back, and um, yeah. So, you know, so honestly, with the materials and their kind of, um, we've been very sensitive. And, I, and the other thing I want to, we want to, I want to go to next is stoneware too. So within the processes, I think we're trying to experiment. And if you can see too, honestly, what I love about clay too is this sense of hand. You know, um, a lot of the, the pottery that I grew up in, one is strata, it's spongeware. And, you know, I look at those every day in my mother's house. And so we're kind of referencing those things. And then also Pennsylvania, um, I hope that people will go and have an, um, the Mercer Museum, you know, um, the Mercer Tile Company. So there's, Pennsylvania has quite a tradition of ceramics. And um, David Ellinger, was a really interesting artist. He, besides being an antiques picker, which means he uh, he was an antiques dealer, he also made furniture. He made ceramic. He did painting. So in the tradition of David and and the tradition of my work, you know, we're trying to bring all these things in. And chat and intuition and hand and ideas of craft are things that I'm really interested in, been in the work forever, and I think were rooted in my Pennsylvania traditions. <laughs> you can see how we want to just have as many materials available for Polly to play with and investigate, and have that particular um, approach that, um, like, the question always comes up is, can we do this? And the answer, we always start with yes and figure out a way to get to maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but the answer is always yes, and we try, um, with, with every visit, we try something new. You know, I think that for me, um, transferring your way of working, you know, if you see that, you know, the installations, it was always working in that space. Like I would take fabric to a space and make a whole show. So for me, the kind of being able to work in a lot of different places and kind of zone everybody out has always been something that I didn't expect that I could do, but it really kind of kept the work going. So that I'm so, um, you know, there. And so that's what I love, you know, honestly, I love, you know, of course I love, you know, making things. But I think it's about, for me, being present. And with COVID having company and, um, 
trying to milk Greg and, and Rachel, you know, for all it's worth, is Greg. Say milk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's, it's been, you know, um, we don't we don't want it to end. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. So. Can I, ask, can, I, can I ask a question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm interested in the comparison you made earlier with printmaking mm -hmm. and knowing about your earlier work, which seems so direct and intuitive. It seems to me, just watching you just today, how, how blind the, some of the processes are. Like none of the colors we're seeing on the table are going to come out. And, and so th there's this feeling of, a, of extra layers of, of a, Blindness, I mean, yeah. and given, yeah. given your impulse to be intuitive, so there's a tension there that I, yeah. that relates to the production of prints too. That I was hoping maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Well, more. you know, um, the thing that um, you know, when we started making prints, it was kind of a you know, it was not we weren't making very beautiful prints, <laughs> and and they're not terrible, but I just you know, it's interesting looking at this and thinking about what is innate to what I do. And these are going to go on the wall, but there is this horizontal, this, this horizontal, and there's a lot. And when we started making prints that were successful, they were this horizontal thing. We made a lot of flowers. They were, I drew them. They were cut out. Of um, wood, we would lay all the color. We would um, ink them. Then we had to turn them over, and they would then put them in the hydraulic press. So I had no idea. I did know. You see, from what you see, when you see them flat, then somebody very skilled and with a hand, turn those over. Now we do them in the etching press, but it was total blind faith. So I think that related to the whole thing, but still, you know, it is. It's like, what this is going to be is, you know, it has to be fine. So I'm always forgetting what color this is. Today I'm putting the colors that I've already used over here, but Rachel knows I'll go, oh my god, I forgot what color was that. So and in the printmaking thing, you know, color on wood doesn't look like what color on paper. And then the white edge of each one. So I think that gave me a little bit more. You know, and so I think that's helped me with this. But you know, there's this once we got this innate horizontal thing, and if you can see my work is flat, you know, we're making bowls. That's a big deal for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what? I don't know if it's um if somebody says I'm visually dyslexic, you know, that's why everything's flat. But you know, it's also simplicity. You know, I like, I relate to things very kind of, I have to, the process for me is, has to make sense. And there is this, you know, I was thinking that the Quaker or Shaker gift to be simple. And I, I, you know, the simplicity, maybe that for me is key. And it makes sense to me. So, once I find a way of working, like how we found a way that was innate to me, almost physical, and it was cutting out those flowers. And you can see, I like a lot of stuff. You know, like I'll make one flower, one flower is not enough. <laughs> I like talking about these are how many flowers you want? It's not a hundred. And how many colors do you want? And the print making is funny because I made with those. And and it's a totally different technique. And I like the prints, but they said, I said, I want a lot of colors. They said, okay, you can have, 
know, maximum we've ever made in lithography is 12. <laughs> like, okay! <laughs> so, obviously, litho was not for me. You know, I want the colors for me as well as possible. You know, of seeing things you've never seen. And I like the kiln, and I like the surprise. You love the surprise, don't you? Never get cold. You know, you open up the kiln, and you're like, wow! Or, I mean, right? <laughs> 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 I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> but I think that kind of keeps the whole process. You know, the process of, you know, over the years when I started John Fabric, it wasn't. This is how we dye fabric. It was, how do I dye fabric? How do I make ceramic with the knowledge that Greg had? So that they're, you know, my vision of the You know, so I think that's kind of why we're always we're trying to find that. Yeah. You know? And the reciprocal part of that is um, how do we create a color palette that's unique to you in this yeah. material? Yeah. I think that's been one of the, um, and that's, that's Rachel's done all the testing. Yeah. You know, I always think that this is enough, you know. I just love the color, you know, the color. And also, it was interesting because we started, um, well, the porcelain color palette, I think it's really beautiful. And even we were making the lines every color. So there was something like, 25 different colors in something like that. Is that why all the lines are different? And then, um, so next time maybe we'll show how you make those because it's it's really beautiful. And then we started um, trying to pour the color on the sum of the heads, and that one's poured. Yeah. And then that head is. Um, Painted. So, you know, with every material and glaze, especially, you know, I was used to glaze out of the can, which is beautiful, you know, and I would just like dump it off, you know, and more the merrier. This I had to get used to. It's like, it's like pastry dish. <laughs> you know, it's, but, you know, I'm fine with that. So, but it, it, it's been, you know, we've been working now, I don't know, a while, and, you know, each step has produced something that we like or we don't like, you know? Yeah, in fact, the, um, the slip casting, the porcelain process emerged out of a, a bit of a failure in trying to take, um, I remember if it was slip or glaze, the slip, like a low temperature slip and build with built sections of a face with that, that fell apart. But it led to the idea of create, being more intentional about it, creating a mold to then, instead of fill it with a low fire slip, move to a high temperature, embed the color in the material, and then build the faces from there. And that's the other thing that we haven't talked about is, you know, high fire color or low fire color. And maybe you can talk about that. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a difference in depth in the way that light reflects off the early work ways and the kind of um, deep color. So that's an early work piece, and then if you hold the flower, the stump, the portion flower next to it, it's very acrobatic. Yeah, so um, what I think is really cool is that these are the same chemicals, uh, just in different applications. And fire to different temperatures, and you get very varied uh, results. You get in the in the um, the one on the my side of the screen, this one here, and um, you you see much more of a block printing quality, more regular. Um, but the color itself, if you get up close to it, is really really deep. Um, you don't see a surface; it's sort of it's colored all the way through. Whereas the other object. Um, intentionally, it's a reference to low temperature glazing in terms of any German application where you see more of Polly's hand in the brushwork, and there's more variation in, in the way color is applied and also reflects light. I think also it's the why I really like the um, 
and what we said depends on any German relationship, but they're almost like more like hexos. Don't you think that? And um, the hands, particularly, I really love the idea. I, I took one home and it's because they're almost like barn faces or barn flowers that they could go outside and inside too. And I think that, you know, the, the pottery was, you know, simple and, and very kind of almost rustic. And so that's kind of why I'm, I'm, I like both. I think that the, maybe the porcelain's your indoor <coughs> floor and the outdoor is the, the, um, the, the terracotta, which I, I, uh, I weekdays love. Weekdays and weekends. And also, yes. And also, the, it, it also relates to Majolica, which I really, or how do you say yeah, it? Yeah, I love it. How do you, do Majolica, I Majolica. Majolica. Um, which the Italian, it's Italian? Yeah, that connects to Italian Rome. Yes, and so I really love the kind of, um, the, the tactility. So that's the word that, you know, for me, the kind of ceramics has this just wonderful tactile quality. Um, a real a kind of physical, a physicality that for me is very good. So we have another question from Ludovica Josha, and he asks, what materials would you like to use that you haven't had the chance to use yet? And thank you so much for this lecture. Um, I think the wax. <laughs> I've been watching that show. What is it called? Um, there's a competition, blown away. <laughs> a glass competition. But you know, it's real interesting. So when I went to Tyler School of Art, it was in Elkins Park, PA, right near where we were, where we are right now. And they had glass, they had ceramics, they had weaving. I was a printmaker and a painting major. So then fast forward, a lot of schools have gotten rid of ceramics, and they um, they had about ten years ago. And this word craft, you know, if you think of the California College of uh, Crafts and you know the Crafts Museum. So, you know, I think that as soon as I got out of school, I was like, why didn't I do all these things? It was right there. And I know Tyler still has, you know, weaving, textiles, still has glass. But, you know, when I went to school, it was this idea of majoring, you know, and it was much more linear. And now I think it's so, you know, a lot of people like Otis, which College of Art, which was one of the very famous schools where Peter Volkis taught and a lot of amazing artists went, they got rid of their ceramics department. So, you know, I think that I'm the generation that for me to go back to this, it was just kind of lucky. But if I had um, my education to go over again, if I could go back, um, I would probably have done all those things. And recently I got a loom. So I took, I went to Haystack and started weaving. So glass, I haven't. <laughs> I mean, you are working in glass right now. Yeah, that's true. So I have glaze, glaze is glass, so right? Glass with a little plant. Yeah. Okay. So I'm doing glass. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that it just, you know, I was, um, you know, the generation that really was about you know painting and sculpture were up here so as soon as i moved to new york you know i'd never had sculpture but i was um i didn't take any sculpture classes but it's been you know a life's work of trying to get all of these things into the into happy happily ever after <laughs> any other questions 
No, but I think we do have time for about one more. Oh, yeah, there. no, those are, I've read, I've read all of the ones that I've read. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a question? Have a question. Um, or Rachel? <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, the, the targets and how they yeah. work in relation to the other iconography. You know, it's interesting because I'm not sure yet. It's more that I really was interested in the utilitarian. Because a lot of you know my work and even this kind of looking at Pennsylvania German and and all of the other work has this idea of the domestic and also the idea of the everyday. So Greg has an incredible history with the utilitarian. So one day I just thought, why not? And the target has been something that, you know, it's been in the work for a long, long time. And it's a way of, and the kind of, um, there's such history with that in painting. Um, and I was also interested in the colors. So that's a way of organizing the color. So I'm not sure, I think, and we were discussing this this morning, that maybe after we do this, it's kind of pushed us there, we'll figure out the iconography of the utilitarian. And it is, there's a picture I have, um, my mother has a, a cup and saucer, a little spatter cup and saucer with a little house in the middle. And with a bird, I was talking with you, you know, we have the heart, we have flowers. These are all things in Pennsylvania German um, practice. So I thought, you know, we'll get some birds in there. We'll also maybe the next step we do after the targets, which come back from earlier work, might be how do we make sense of the utilitarian in uh, the in the dishes. So I, I didn't want to rule it out. I wanted to start that because it's something I've never done before. And that's sort of, I think that's how it happened. We yeah, just said, I right. want to do this. Right. It seemed like a unique opportunity to experiment and try something along those lines. I think it connects to the domestic. Yeah. And to me, it connects to um, the rugs and that yes. sense of domesticity as well. Yeah. I think that, you know, that you know, this whole idea of home and this whole idea of, for me, everybody being in their homes, it, it's really um, a history. You know, I've always loved, you know, I love art. <laughs> I, love it. I love painting. And a lot of things, you know, for me, what's not so, um, but I'm also somebody who's deeply, has a deep history with abstraction, but also pop, you know, so of this world. So, you know, it's balancing, you know, the everyday and the conceptual and your past, which is all these things, you know. And now I'm particularly focused on the, because of um, the painter, uh, David Ellinger, but you know, that idea of the domestic has been in everything I do. Look at the material, look at the, you know, this hybrid place. So I think we'll get there, but also important for me, a residency is about trying everything. And so I didn't want to not do this, even though it might not be connected. And then, you know, I tried to bring it in one sense, but I'm not sure it's there yet. So I love them. And, you know, I'm, I'm ready to take them home. <laughs> 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 but those, the target was very important for the, the, for the two shows that I did last year.
So I think, and you know, the faces, things come out of it, like the faces came out of the potential of women, of kind of graphic iconography, but it, it changed. So now, kind of, these are this, now we'll see what the change is. So, now somebody who really has to, you know, see things. I think that, I know that sounds kind of bizarre, but, you know, if I came here and said, I want to do a house, you know, it doesn't make sense. I have to draw that house and then make it there. So the step is, I don't, you know, I want to make some bowls, but I have to start from something. And, and, it, and it really is, for me, usually related to the thing I do. And we're at time, so thank you. Polly, Greg, and Rachel and Richard, all of you for sharing your time with us today. Um, and I hope that everyone has a good rest of their day today. Thank you so much. Thank you.